Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, this is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I am pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled The Science Behind Diagnosing and Treating ADHD in Older Adults. This is a fascinating and vitally important topic. Um, It impacts the lives of millions of people over the age of 50 who have spent a lifetime blaming themselves for symptoms of a neurological condition uh, that was never screened for, detected, or treated, maybe misdiagnosed. Um, Today, we will learn how ADHD changes with age, uh, why diagnosis at any age is vital, and what treatments uh, work best for older adults. We are honored to welcome as today's ADHD expert, David W. Goodman, MD. Dr. Goodman is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He is also Director of the Adult Attention Deficit Disorder Center of Maryland and Director of Suburban Psychiatric Associates, LLC. A graduate of Albany Medical College of Union University, Dr. Goodman completed a medical and psychiatric internship at Baltimore City Hospital and his psychiatric residency at Johns Hopkins in 1986. Dr. Goodman has continued a full-time clinical practice focusing on the diagnosis and treatment of mood disorders, adult ADHD, and anxiety disorders for more than 30 years. So uh, before I hand the microphone over to Dr. Goodman, We're very excited to get started. Um, I have just a few housekeeping items that I will take care of very quickly. Uh, Those of you who have tuned into the live webinar, you can download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, please just look for instructions in an email that you will receive about an hour after we wrap up the live broadcast today. If you're listening in replay mode or podcast mode, um, you can visit attitudemag.com and search for podcast 344 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. And finally, if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family, to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. And that is why we're here today. Thank you, Dr. Goodman, so much for joining us and for leading this incredibly important discussion on ADHD in older adults. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. We're going to talk about older adults. Hopefully with this first slide, you're, uh, you're smiling. This is my idea of watching uh, that old movie, remember, with, with Fonda and Nicholson. Well, ADHD in adults is not very well recognized in older adults. There's a uh, little focus on this. I know Kathy Nadeau, Dr. Nadeau, gave a a, a very good webinar for Attitude Magazine some months ago. And so if you ever want more information, go to her webinar as well. I welcome you today to my office. I am speaking to you from my office. Hopefully I'll maintain your attention on the slides because there's a lot of stuff in the background in my office. So do I have... Do I have control here? There we go. Okay. So why consider ADHD in older adults? You know, my colleagues will say, look, why why do we need to bother? Because they've lived with it their whole lives. Why bother treating it now? Well, that might make sense at face value, but it really doesn't make sense once you realize the impairments that people have uh, and the impact on self-esteem, which I'm going to spend some time focused on. A number of things I want to put everybody on the same page here. First, ADHD is a a childhood-based disorder that continues into adults for about 60% of the children. 
We know this by following children into adulthood. The longest prospective study is 33 years with a scientific publication on that. There's more research on ADHD in general than any other medical condition. Yes, you heard that right. There's more research on ADHD than any other medical condition. The genetics account for 75%. So if you're in a family and your child has ADHD, the likelihood that one of the two parents has it is about 40 to 50%. And so I end up treating multiple family members, both children, uh, adolescents, adults, and then grandparents all in the same family. It's fascinating. The difficulty with the research is that the clinical trials really don't include people over the age of 65. Now, is that discriminatory? The answer to that is yes, but it's for medical reasons. The companies want to exclude people over the age of 65 because they have medical issues or they're on other medications, which introduces noise into figuring out whether medication is helpful or not. Lizdex amphetamine, which is Vyvanse, only had trials up to 55, uh, age 55. I was also involved in a number of the clinical trials for medicines for ADHD that are currently on the market. So I'm intimately aware of some of the research aspects here. ADHD is typically not diagnosed in people over the age of 50 or 60. So if you say, if you weren't diagnosed as a child, you can't have ADHD as an adult, that's just not correct. We also know that over the course of the lifespan, ADHD individuals have negative consequences. For adults, for example, they're more likely, they're twice as likely to be divorced. They're much more likely to be arrested for criminal activity. They have increased debt. So as you get older, these impairments also play out in regards to job promotion or a frequent loss of job over the course of 10 years, difficulty filing paperwork. You know, it used to be said when you were retired, there's not much to do. Well, if, if you're a retired individual over the age of 50 or 60 or 70, you realize there's a lot of paperwork that goes into managing your life, insurance, Medicare, medical bills, medical appointments, um, all kinds of paperwork that you have to keep track of and attend to. And that really becomes taxing for somebody who has untreated ADHD. It is important to understand that ADHD is not just some rare psychiatric condition. This slide shows you what the prevalence rate is. That is, what percentage of the population has a particular psychiatric condition? So schizophrenia is 1%. Dementias are about 1.5%. Bipolar disorder is about 2%. OA, is older adults with ADHD is about 3%. Generalized anxiety disorder is 3%. Adult ADHD, that is between the ages of 18 and 44, is about 3.5%. And major depression is about 7%. So you look at this and you go, wow, adult ADHD is actually the second most prevalent psychiatric disorder of all of the major psychiatric conditions. And ADHD in older adults at 3% is, is even more than bipolar disorder and equal to generalized anxiety disorder. So you're talking about millions of people who have this condition who have not been treated, uh, diagnosed, uh, or even identified. However, the good news is there's a growing awareness of ADHD in people over the age of 50. This is largely international research. The, the, one of the best groups on doing this research is out of Amsterdam, and they've published a fair number of articles. I'm actually the first author on the first worldwide literature review of adults with ADHD over the age of 50. So I, I know this literature quite well. And as a result, though, there's an increasing awareness. And I'm glad that everyone here is listening to this program and or will listen because of the registrants who are unable to attend, because this is only one of the few places you're gonna be able to get all this information in one area. Now, about 10 years ago, I was the author on a manuscript that we looked at life transitions. And I apologize, you may not be able to read this slide well, but basically it's looking at developmental stages 
and what the responsibilities are and how they change as one goes from childhood to adolescence to middle age and then older adults. Now, I'll confess, when we wrote this paper, there wasn't much on older adults at all. And so if you look at the later adulthood column, you'll notice that there's a, a smaller list than there are for the other transitional developmental periods. But rest assured that I have become more aware of what these issues are, and I would expand that list of impairments and challenges in older life. So what's the difference, though, between a diagnosis in children and a diagnosis in adults? Well, again, as I mentioned, most older adults were never diagnosed. If you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and you were raised, you grew up in the 60s, the 50s, and the 70s, ADHD was really not on the landscape, except for the, except for the boys who were bouncing off the room, and anyone in the room would have been able to make the diagnosis. But if you were not disruptive and not talkative and getting average grades, even though you couldn't pay attention and you couldn't remember and you were highly forgetful, you didn't get diagnosed. They simply said, well, that's just Johnny, that's just Susie, and, um, and we'll just have to deal with who they are as a person. It wasn't recognized as a disorder then. And by the way, as we moved into the 70s and 80s uh, and even 90s, people said ADHD was a, a label for children that was pejorative, and we shouldn't label children with these disorders. Well, that's like saying a person having a heart attack is being labeled as having a heart condition. Does that mean you wouldn't treat them? Absolutely not. So fortunately, we've moved away from, away from that <clears throat> interpretation. Now, there was a large study called the National Comorbidity Survey Replication. This is a US study <clears throat> that looked at thousands of adults. And what they found was that 75% of adults with ADHD were never diagnosed as children. If you look at those who are older, over 60, none of them were diagnosed as children. So again, if you weren't diagnosed as a, as a child, you can't have it as an adult is absolutely not correct. So let's just talk about some concepts. My, my mentors used to say, if you didn't get the concepts correct, then everything that went through those concepts and came out was just gonna be garbage. So for children, you have symptoms and impairments, and that's when the child gets diagnosed. However, what if the impairments don't show up until later in life? <clears throat> and they don't show up later in life because you went to a private school, so you had um, a small classroom, you had parents who were very involved in overseeing you and keeping being on track, you had tutors, perhaps you were a bright student. But eventually the demands of the environment will exceed your ability to compensate. And that's why the developmental stages that I mentioned earlier are important. Because when people come in, I say, you've had this your whole life. Why are you coming in now? And they'll tell me that the demands now are exceeding their ability to compensate. And people are complaining about their inconsistent performance. So it's when those impairments arise that people come in and get diagnosed. The other reason why adults and especially older adults will come in is because a child, an adult child gets diagnosed and they turn to their parent and say, you know, you, you were like this when, when I was a kid, you were showing up late to, to, uh, to school to pick me up. Um, teachers were meeting with you and saying that, that I'm coming to late school. Uh, you weren't signing the papers that I needed to take back to school. And so you can track this back. It's interesting because the, the child in a family will get diagnosed. Then the parent gets diagnosed and the parent turns to their parent and says, you know, you might want to get this evaluated. Yet the complication of making this diagnosis in adults is medical. And so there are medical illnesses that will compl complicate cognitive ability. If you're on several medications, they may have impact. If you're drinking or, or using other drugs to compromise cognition, that can be a problem. And then you have what's called pseudo-dementia of depression. This is where older people get depressed, but they don't complain about depression. They complain about not being motivated, apathetic, hopeless, and their cognitive ability, their thinking ability is severely compromised. It's almost as if they look like they're demented, but in fact, they're not. If you treat the depression, the cognitive abilities get better. 
The other issues in age, though, that one needs to be aware of is that you can have age-related cognitive decline. That is forgetfulness. You forget people's names. You forget your keys. Uh, you misspell things. You forget your appointments. But that wasn't how you were 10 years ago. Also, women who are peri- and post-menopause will also complain of cognitive changes. There's something called MCI, mild cognitive impairment, also a bit more severe than age-related cognitive change, but not so severe that you get a diagnosis of dementia. And then you have early dementia onsets. All of the green arrows above the ages all occur later in life. It's not childhood symptoms. So all of these folks can be distinguished from ADHD because if you ask them 10 years ago, were you like this? They often say, no, I was not. And if that's the case, it's not ADHD that has to be chronic and relatively unchanging over the course of somebody's life. So sadly though, this was a survey of memory clinics. Unfortunately, only one in five were regularly screening for ADHD. Four out of five memory clinics were not even considering ADHD as part of a considered diagnosis for cognitive changes. And so ADHD symptomatology may not have been considered as a pre-morbid baseline cognitive function. When you looked at these clinics, 55% responded that they were seeing and making new diagnosis of ADHD with their increasing awareness. But often ADHD is not considered. And in there, you lose the opportunity to effectively treat somebody with cognitive changes that you simply ascribe to age-related or perimenopause or other circumstances. So older adult diagnosis, let's just look at some studies here. And, and again, the reason I'm presenting this information is because I want you to see what the research is. And that becomes the basis upon which we decide how to make a diagnosis and what effective treatment is. So when we looked at patients in a Alzheimer's center, and we looked at 300 respondents, we gave them what's called the Winder Utah rating scale. And this is a scale for measuring ADHD. About four and a half percent in this Alzheimer's group would have fulfilled criteria for ADHD. Four and a half percent. They tried to do neuropsychological testing to try to distinguish those people with ADHD from those people that didn't have ADHD by history. And counterintuitively, the neuropsychological tests doesn't differentiate people with ADHD and non-ADHD. And so it's very important then if a doctor says, well, let's send you for neuropsychological testing to sort out what's going on, it may not be able to say whether you have ADHD or not. And since neuropsychological testing can run thousands of dollars, unless there's gonna be a definitive answer for the diagnosis and treatment options, I don't routinely send people for neuropsychological testing for ADHD. I may send them for neuropsychological testing to find other elements of their cognitive ability, but that is not used to make the diagnosis of ADHD in older adults. There's a Swedish study that looked at older adults, 60 to 75, younger adults, 18 to 45, and then healthy adults. This was in Sweden. About half the patients were on medication, and we're gonna talk about medication for ADHD individuals. But this also states the same thing. What you're looking at is a graph. On the x-axis, there's a measure of no deficits, single deficits, and multiple deficits. The blue bars are the younger adults. The rose bars are the older adults. And what you look at under multiple deficits is that the younger adults had more neuropsychological deficits than the older adults. So again, just to drive this point home, neuropsychological testing is not the way to make a diagnosis. Now, when you see a physician or a clinician who's medically trained, they have to consider a number of other psychiatric and medical conditions before they come to the conclusion of ADHD. And so this is a fairly complex evaluation done by someone with experience and medical background to be able to distinguish what's ADHD, what's dementia, what's age-related cognitive change, 
what's perimenopause. You can have more than one. The other aspect with ADHD in adults is there's a lot of coexisting psychiatric conditions. So this is just another study out of the Netherlands looking at ADHD and other psychiatric issues. And what they found, as you might expect, older adults with ADHD had significantly lower self-esteem and sense of mastery, higher levels of neuroticism, that's anxiety, and, and a sense of social inadequacy. So it does have an impact over time. And these impacts on self-image, self-esteem, sense of mastery are, are compounded by the demands of the environment. Here's a Norway study. And again, I run through these international studies. So you don't think that ADHD in adults, older adults, or even in children is somehow a fabrication of US culture. It is absolutely not. Pick a country around the world and I'll show you research published in that country on ADHD. So this is a Norway study looking at coexisting psychiatric conditions. And what they found in these patients is that 50% of them had other psychiatric symptoms, depression in a third, anxiety in a quarter, bipolar disorder in a quarter. And so when people have ADHD as well as coexisting psychiatric conditions, you have to figure out which you treat first, second, and third. And that comes to medical uh, issues and medications as well as psychotherapies. There's also another US study looking at this and they come up with the same thing. So the point here is don't break your arm patting yourself on the back if you make a diagnosis of ADHD in older adults. If you haven't also elicited issues of depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, substance abuse, and other conditions. So now we move to medication. And I know I'm running through this quickly. This webinar is going to be recorded. You can go back and replay it uh, as many times or as slowly as you would like. You also have the slides that are being downloaded so you can review them. Uh, you can use this presentation to substitute for sleep medication at night if you'd like as well. So in regards to medications for AD, older adults with ADHD, it's important to understand, as I mentioned before, if you're over the age of 50, you are very likely on other medications. So 75% of, of this study looked at that, and people were on a variety of medications, antihypertensive med medicines, pain medicines, anticonvulsants, antidepressants. They're also on diabetic medication, asthma medication, cardiac medication. So again, if somebody's prescribing, they really do need to be aware of what medications you're on, including anything over the counter you take as a supplement. And we can talk about supplements in the Q&A if somebody asks the question. But drug interactions and the suitability of medication for a patient is also critically important. What about approval? Here's one of the bugaboos, because the clinical trial submitted to the FDA only included up to the age of 50. All of the stimulation, all of the stimulants have upper age limits of 55, except for Lisdex amphetamine, which is Vyvanse. And in that trial, we only accepted patients up to the age of 55. Oris methylphenidate or mixed amphetamine salt. So Oris methylphenidate is Concerta, Mixed amphetamine salts, XR, is Adderall. They have maximum age doses up to 65. Now, for several years, this became a problem for patients because Medicare may not cover these medications because there's no FDA approval over the age of 65. And they were saying, this is experimental and we don't approve that. That's been slowly changing. But if you run into that issue, you'll understand here is what the explanation is. There's really been no symptom systematic study of these medications in older adults, either in regards to tolerability, and that is side effects, or drug interactions, or interactions with other medications and medical illness. So we try, we, the clinicians, try to cobble together what research there is and make our best clinical judgment. Also, there's very few studies looking at the pharmacokinetics, that is the way in which these drugs get metabolized in older adults versus younger adults. You know, as you get older, 
the rate of metabolism of certain drugs and medications change. Uh, for those of you who are older and drink, you'll realize that you can't drink as much alcohol as you used to, and that's because the enzymes responsible for metabolizing alcohol slow down, and so your tolerance is much lower. So I mentioned why adults are excluded from research protocols. I'll just enumerate that a little bit. Sometimes it's diagnostic uncertainty. We can't get the history in childhood or early adolescence in order to substantiate the fact that the symptoms have been chronic. Also, they're eliminated because we don't want to induce uh, a higher degree of side effects in older adults. There are safety concerns, as I mentioned, potential drug interactions, because in clinical trials, we really do have subjects who are not on other medications, don't have other medical and psychiatric conditions. So it's a very clean research population. It's not like the average person walking around. Also difficulty excluding candidates based on exclusionary criteria. That is, do you have other psychiatric conditions? If you have a heart condition, you can't be in the study. If you have asthma, you can't be in the study. If you have hypertension, you can't be in the study. So you can see why doing research with ADHD in older adults is, is problematic. Before we move on to medication, I just wanna highlight a critical piece of information. And that is that stimulant medication when prescribed, if you have a positive response, it doesn't mean you have ADHD. If I give everyone watching this program a stimulant medication, 95% of you will say your energy, your mood, and your cognitive ability are better. It doesn't mean you have ADHD. It means that I've manipulated norepinephrine and dopamine, and that's the psychological experience. The converse is true. So if you don't respond to a stimulant medication, it must mean you don't have ADHD, and that's not true also. So up to 30% of adults with ADHD won't respond to the first stimulant prescribed. And so the moral of the story here is it's important to be accurate and nail the, nail the diagnosis down first with the history and then prescribe medication because the medication response does not confirm the diagnosis. It may help you feel better about the diagnosis, but unless you have the diagnosis accurately made and the clinician says, well, let's give it to you and see what happens, you're probably going to feel better. And that means that people will end up on medication that they perhaps ought not be on. That's why Starbucks exists. You go to Starbucks, you drink your cafe, cup of coffee, <clears throat> your energy, your mood, and your cognition is better. It's simply the effect of caffeine. It's not that you have caffeine deficiency syndrome. So are these people on medication? So this is a survey of about 150 older adults over the age of, um, of 50. 63. 4% reported that they were on medication. 24% said that they had been on medicine, that they stopped. 23% said that they were not on medication. And about a third were being seen in some form of ADHD therapy, organizational techniques, behavioral compensatory skills. So these medications for ADHD are being prescribed, and a great many of the older adults who are prescribed medication end up remaining on it. Now, in this study, 82% were prescribed methylphenidate. So you know that as Ritalin or Concerta, and 10% were amphetamines, 5% on non-stimulants. So you look at this and you say, well, Dr. Goodman, maybe, maybe methylphenidate works better in adults over the age of 50. And I often present slides. I tell you what you see. I tell you what you conclude. Then I tell you what you don't see, which will change the conclusion. What you don't see that's important to understand is that this was a European study. And in Europe, the bulk of stimulants prescribed are methylphenidate. So it's not that this study reflects methylphenidate is better than amphetamines for older adults. It simply reflects the geography uh, and the prescription practice in Europe versus the United States. Who is prescribing? So again, this is a European survey. About 60% were family doctors, 35% were psychiatrists. This is in part because it's hard to see psychiatrists in Europe, and it's even harder to see psychiatrists who know anything about ADHD in Europe. 
But interestingly, a few years ago, if you looked at the prescription practice in the United States, about 65% of primary care physicians, 65% of primary care physicians were prescribing stimulant medication. So 10 years ago, the bulk of stimulants were prescribed by psychiatrists, child and adults. Um, but now the bulk of stimulants are being prescribed by primary care physicians. Well, these older adults on medication reported their, their attention was better than non-medicated. They had better ability to manage their life demands versus those who had stopped their ADHD. There was an increased use of extended release methylphenidate for its longer duration during the day. And then patients were diagnosed later in life may not respond as well to medication. I know this is the finding of this research, but I've got to tell you, in my clinical practice of 35 years and thousands of patients, I find that older adults are responding equally well to these medications when appropriately dosed. There are now 30 stimulant preparations on the market. There are more preparations for ADHD than any other medical illness on the planet. And so this is very confusing because how do you know what medication to prescribe? Well, there are five compounds, methylphenidate and demethylphenidate. So you know that as Ritalin, Focalin, Concerta. And then there's amphetamine. MAS is mixed amphetamine salt, which is Adderall or Adderall XR. D-amphetamine is dextroamphetamine. So you pick a compound, see if the person responds. And clinicians will pick the compound based on, on their experience with efficacy, how effective was it, and their familiarity. Were they trained on one compound versus another? And then they choose the medication delivery system based on how long do I want it to last and what are the side effects likely to be? So there are short-acting versions of each of these compounds, and there are longer-acting versions of these compounds, some of which have been documented to work up to 16 hours. It depends on what the length and demands of your day are going to be and how reliably you can take medication once a day versus three or four times a day. There are side effects to be considered, insomnia, GI upset, decreased appetite, weight loss, headaches. Dry mouth I want to highlight, especially in older adults who may be on other medications. Dry mouth is not a benign symptom. Chronically, it accelerates recession of your gums and increases the likelihood of having cavities. If you have dentures, it's, um, it's going to compl complicate their, their, um, their fitting and their adhesion, constipation, hand tremors. This is worsened by caffeine, so I tell people to cut back on their coffee or eliminate caffeine altogether. The same thing is true for jitteriness. Unfortunately, there are no randomized controlled trials looking at adverse events in older adults. So we really are playing this by ear and observation and learning as we, as we treat patients. The side effects may be more of an issue for older adults. Uh, another example of this would be dry eye for somebody who's wearing contact lenses. That can become, uh, become an issue as well. And there are some, there's some research here that shows that Patients who had never been on medication might be a little bit more sensitive. So when I start somebody who's newly diagnosed on stimulant medicine, I generally start low um, and go slower than I might do with people who are younger. And psychotherapy, as I wrap up, I just want to mention something about psychotherapy. It's, it's often discussed in regards to organizational skills, behavioral compensation, visual uh, cues, auditory cues, uh, executive functioning um, assistance. But I want to talk about an element of psychotherapy that has not really been addressed, and I think it's quite unique for older adults. And that is, if you live your life with ADHD untreated, you begin to assume that all of the deficits and all the experiences are you as a person. That gets reinforced by the fact that the environment tells you you're lazy, you're unmotivated, you're inconsistent, you're stupid. I had a patient who came to me, a Hispanic woman. She said she, she had been told for years as a child she was mentally retarded. Imagine 
believing that you're mentally retarded for decades. And then somebody says you have ADHD, they put you on medication, your mind opens up, you can think clearly, and you have to erase decades of belief that you were mentally retarded. Here's the critical issue for psychotherapy in adults who are older, and that is if you get accurately diagnosed and if the treatment is effective, you will learn to distinguish what you have from who you are. And that liberating revelation is really critical to people. And that's the reason to answer the first question on the first slide of why bother treating this, because the person would like to know that this wasn't me. This was a condition I had that I didn't choose to have that was given to me by genetics. And it's not who I am as a person. And all of those criticisms and all of those lost relationships and all of those squandered opportunities were an outgrowth of my illness and not me as a person. I hope I've stated that as emphatically as I can because I truly, truly believe that that is one of the critical aspects of psychotherapy for ADHD and older adults. And so what did you learn? First, screening for ADHD and cognitive complaints in older adults is really important. Cognitive complaints in older adults should not be easily discounted as, look, you're not a spring chicken. And by the way, if your uh, physician, clinician, nurse practitioner says that to you and you have a sense that this is more than what that is and your adult child was diagnosed five years ago, go see someone who has experience and expertise in making this diagnosis. I don't know if you have it, but it's really helpful for somebody to say, no, that's not what this is. Medical etiologies need to be assessed, but medical etiologies for cognitive complaints occur in the adulthood, not in childhood. And that's the cornerstone of the diagnosis of ADHD. If you ask the person, were you like this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they say no, then it's probably not ADHD. Impairments persist into an older adulthood that I mentioned. Treatments are really effective. I can't tell you how many patients with ADHD over the age of 50, newly diagnosed, treated, have come back and said, wow, this, is, this has changed my life, and it's changed my sense of who I am as a person. And so it's never too late for treatment. There are the opportunity to ask me questions. I'm happy to. I appreciate your attention. I hope you learned something out of this. I know it was a lot of information, um, but if you, if you know me and work with me, you know that I, I really base my patient care on a combination of research and decades of experience. So I, I appreciate your listening, and I appreciate Attitudes Magazine for the invitation to present this information. So let's go to questions. Yes, Dr. Goodman, thank you so much. That was um, a truly insightful and, and helpful presentation. And I personally appreciate your point at the end of the importance of separating the condition from the person. Um, I think that's such a, a critical point to make. So I will dive right in because we do have a lot of questions and quite a few from uh, from women, some of whom, many of whom have been diagnosed with anxiety and depression. And they are wondering if the onset of menopause, perimenopause, um, plus uh, retirement, the loss of your normal routine, can that sort of uh, spark uh, an ADHD diagnosis or, or manifestation of symptoms in a way that they may not have recognized uh, previously in their lives? Uh, great question. Uh, common experience. I'm going to separate these out into several categories. So cognitive changes with perimenopause and menopause is a physiologic uh, manifestation of what's changing in your brain in reaction to changing hormones. And so every woman has a different experience with that but it clearly is marked in a point of time in your late 40s, early 50s, whenever you go through that change of life. 
The other aspect is it's also at that period of time that jobs may change, people may retire um, at that point. And so I'll put the change in circumstances and environment in the psychological category. So we have a, a physiologic category of peri or postmenopausal, and then you have the the psychological aspects of changing the environment. And you'll have cognitive changes as a result of both the physiologic and the environmental changes, but you don't have ADHD as a disorder unless the cognitive difficulties you're having predated those elements of environmental or biologic change. So again, if you weren't like this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever is happening now is not likely ADHD. And then that has to be addressed um, as a non-ADHD cognitive change. In regards to the depression and the anxiety, if the depression and anxiety pre-existed the perimenopause, then you have a pre-existing psychiatric condition that should be treated uh, accordingly. If you have ADHD and depression um, as, a, as a middle-aged adult, it's hard to tell whether the depression is secondary to the ADHD impairment or whether the depression is independent of the ADHD impairment. The same thing is true for anxiety. Is the anxiety an outgrowth of the ADHD impairment or is the anxiety independent of the ADHD environment? If you're following along here then, the question is if you have several changes, cognitive decline, depression, anxiety, and ADHD, you have to line up these conditions in, in what's called a diagnostic prioritization. Which do you treat first, second, and third if you're pursuing this with medication especially? Because the object here is to treat one condition without making the others worse. And this is very individual. Um, I'd have to spend an hour describing how to distinguish whether your depression is primary or secondary or whether the anxiety is primary or secondary. But usually, if you go through a sequence of medication trials, you can, sort, you can sort that out. I spend a lot of time talking about our medication because that's my expertise that people want to hear today. But I'm in no way diminishing the role of psychotherapy, cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy, um, insight-oriented psychotherapy. We also include spouses, the non-ADHD spouse really needs to have a healthy understanding of what this is. Just because your spouse doesn't listen to you at dinner and shows up late to appointments doesn't mean they're passive aggressive and trying to deliberately annoy you. That person may have ADHD and that's simply a manifestation of their symptoms. So psychotherapy is also very important in regards to managing ADHD, depression, and anxiety as well. Um, I can't address the specifics of each of your situation, but hopefully the, the segmentation of these different elements allows you to think about it in a, in a clearer way. Great. Thank you. You you were talking about spouses there, and we had one interesting question come in um, on this related to this topic. Do you have any advice or guidance for a spouse of an individual who was diagnosed with ADHD as a child so they understand its impact but they are over now over 55, not receiving any formal treatment. And the spouse is worried that they're starting to um, experience symptoms of depression and anxiety related to ADHD plus pandemic. Um, any advice for um, helping your, your loved one to recognize that ADHD uh, diagnosis and, or treatment in this case can be impactful at any age? So I suppose the question is, is the person self-aware and would acknowledge that they have symptoms of ADHD that cause inconsistent performance during the day? That really is the first step because you need the person to have some sense of self-observation and, and receptivity to the fact that there may be effective treatment. Um, if, they're, if they're receptive to consider it, then have the person fill out a ADHD adult self-report rating scale. You can find that on the internet. It's available at our website at www.addadult.com. It's also available on other websites. 
it's the 18 symptoms out of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for ADHD. And the person rates it based on a frequency of experience. If they go through that symptom checklist honestly, and they start seeing that they're rating high frequencies on several symptoms, at least it drives the point home that they still have the symptoms. And then you try to get them to acknowledge that these symptoms cause them inconsistency during the day, uh, it causes them distress, they're getting demoralized, they're getting anxious, they're worrying about getting things done, and then having them see somebody who knows ADHD. Please, please go see somebody who knows what ADHD is, because um, uh, something that will retard getting treatment is if you see a clinician and they say, no, you don't have that, then the person can wave the flag and say, see, you were wrong. I don't have it. I don't need help. And now the, AD, the non-ADHD spouse is left um, just frustrated that they can't move the ball forward. Um, as people get older, then you do have age-related changes. So in your 50s, and certainly 60s, people will say, look, I can't remember his name. I can't remember a song. I can't remember a movie, an actor. Um, I sometimes can't hold variables in my head. That's age-related. And it's not as though it's ADHD or age-related. I have patients who have now been seeing for 30 years, and I've watched them go through this. Their ADHD existed. Now they have age-related cognitive changes on top of their ADHD. And so medication won't improve the age-related changes because they're a bit different than the, than the ADHD symptoms. And it really is important to try to make that distinction. When you get into mild cognitive changes and dementias, then the cognitive changes um, are somewhat different. People stumble over spelling words. Uh, they're more forgetful. They can't hold variables and pieces of information in their head as they used to. They can't look at a set of numbers and then turn away and recall all the numbers. Those are age-related um, and even maybe more severe mild cognitive changes. And again, those are not necessarily going to respond to medication. So why is it important to make that distinction? Because if you don't make that distinction and you think that this is just ADHD getting worse, then you start increasing your medication and the person ends up on higher doses of medication than they need to be on. And so that's why I try to make these, these subtle but important diagnostic distinctions. And, and again, this comes from decades of experience, and you just need to see someone who knows how to separate this out. In regards to, and I can speak for paragraphs, I apologize. Um, in regards to the depression and anxiety, if you go see somebody, if this person's spouse goes see somebody and they're complaining about depression and anxiety, but they don't raise the ADHD issue, they're going to end up on medication for depression and anxiety. And their mood might be a bit better, their anxiety might be a bit better, but their cognitive ability will not improve. Uh, so that's, I think, as much as I have to say. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Um, you, a lot of people wondering the best way to find an ADHD specialist, and specifically they're wondering, should I find someone who specializes in adult ADHD. So resources for finding clinicians who do ADHD. One would be Attitude Magazine. I know that um, Attitude Magazine has a directory of clinicians who purport to be experts on ADHD. So presumably they have experience in doing that. Um, adult psychiatrists who specialize in adult ADHD. So Attitude Magazine, there's another national organization called chad.org. It's the children and adults with ADHD. They also have a directory. But the simplest way might be to simply type in adult ADD and put in your zip code in a Google search and see what pops up. And then just check the credentials. How long have they been in practice? Um, what do they report to be an expert in? The person who has a long list of expertise probably knows a bit about everything. Uh, you know, it's a mile wide and an inch deep. Look for people who um, have smaller lists of expertise. You might actually also do another search in pubmed.gov. Pubmed.gov. That is the website for all of the published research on ADHD. And if you put in the person's name, 
and they've published, at least you now know that they have that level of expertise as well. Um, if you have other other friends or uh, family members that have had children treated with ADHD, ask them who their doctor is. Now that may be a child, a child psychiatrist or child psychologist, um, but if you call that person, they know people who do adult ADHD as well. If you're in urban settings, you're very much likely to find people. If you're in rural settings, it is really, really tough. One of the advantages to COVID and doing evaluations by Zoom now is that you actually have access to any expert in the country who is seeing new patients. And they can do a virtual evaluation by Zoom or any other video conference uh, platform. Um, and so you're not limited by geography at this point. And that will probably continue into the future. So those are my suggestions for uh, accessing the resources to identify somebody. Wonderful. Yes. Um, and we do, and we do in fact have a directory. It's um, directory.attitudemag.com. So um, it is uh, organized by, by location as well. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, a couple people asking if they should um, request or, or bring up with their doctor a specific uh, neuropsych test um, that you would recommend for older adults. Um, and a few people asking if there are merits to, to brain mapping as part of the diagnostic process. Good. Okay. So let's go back to neuropsych testing. As I mentioned before, there's not really a clear utility to neuropsych testing. Uh, one study I didn't present by Dr. Thorell out of um, Sweden, she's at the Carolina Institute. She also did another study looking at older adults with and without ADHD. And what they found was that neuropsychological testing will not make the diagnosis and will not distinguish ADHD and older adults from non-ADHD older adults. So I, I would... I would refrain from spending thousands of dollars. The, um, so two things about ADHD. One is, um, again, try to find the adult ADHD self-report scale, which is 18 symptoms, and just fill that out on your own or have a family member fill that out if you're concerned about their, their symptoms. And take that to the clinician that you go to and say, you know, I was looking about ADHD, and, and this is my experience with these symptoms. Um, you also have to tell the clinician that you had these symptoms when you were a child, an adolescent, uh, a middle adolescent as a teenager. So they get the anchor that the diagnosis and the symptoms really go all the way back in one's life. Um, so I mentioned neuropsychological testing. The uh, Get the symptom checklist. Again, the adult self-report ADHD scale. Am I missing something on that question? I feel as though I've missed something. Oh, um, a couple of questions about brain scans or brain mapping, if that should be a part of the diagnostic process. Okay, so there are a lot of peripheral, um, both tests, diagnostic tests, and I put that in quotes, and treatments. So in regards to diagnostic tests, some people will go off and get a specialized spec scan. Again, it's being done at centers, but I'll tell you the research is really quite parse. There, there's not a lot of support for doing this. So again, these kinds of uh, neuroimaging studies are not recommended, don't make the diagnosis. Brain mapping also doesn't make the diagnosis. It may give a suggestion of, but ultimately the diagnosis is gonna have to be made clinically um, on the history of elements that I that I said, childhood symptoms, chronicity of symptoms, impairment of symptoms over developmental stages of life, family psychiatric history, certainly in a first degree family member. Putting all that together um, is a lot more effective in making an accurate diagnosis than going for all of these tests. I just want to mention something about treatments. There are a lot of treatments out there that purport to be effective. Um, there's a lot of supplements that report to be effective. And I've got to tell you, the research on these supplements in, in good controlled trials is not very, um, not very good, actually. Um, 
There is a there's a particular product on the market that gets a lot of marketing, and the clinical trials are just not there. The same thing is true for neurofeedback. So neurofeedback is a way of trying to alter alpha and theta waves, alpha, beta, and theta waves, in order to increase attention. And so some studies are positive and some studies are negative. And if you look at the, uh, the collection of these studies, it really is quite equivocal. Now, the reason I mention that is because neurofeedback is something you do, you have to do every day. It goes on for four or six weeks. And again, it costs thousands of dollars. So the question is, what treatments are useful and effective and cost-effective? And which treatments will have sustaining ability versus those that are just tied to a particular task? So if you play a video game, does that mean that your attention is going to be better on your homework or your office work? Not clear that it is. And that's called generalization. Will the skill done and learned in one task generalize to another task that hasn't been part of the training. You mentioned supplements, which is great. That was the, the next biggest topic um, that we heard in our questions. A lot of people who are looking to, um, to either augment their treatment plan or um, are hesitant to take a stimulant medication, wondering about not just supplements, but also if you um, have any recommended dietary or lifestyle changes and any vitamins that you see help with adult ADHD. Right. Okay. Well, this is, um, you, you'll invite me back for another whole life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what's, what's, what's the science and what's the myth? Um, so let's talk about supplements. Um, and, and this is where I, this is where I tend to commit professional suicide, and and so be it. Um, there's a product called Prevagen on the market. Um, Wired Magazine had an eviscerating investigation of Prevagen in the company. It was not complimentary at all. Um, the research in well-controlled trials is simply not there. The same thing is true for Focus Factor, Activate, and a variety of these other agents. Now, having said that, I don't stand in the way of my patients taking it. I say, look, what's the target symptoms? What are we going to monitor? You take it for two months. At the end of two months, let's have an honest discussion of what the original target symptoms were and whether it made any change. At the end of two months, if there really is not a substantial difference, then it's not working. If you kind of think there's sort of a benefit, then it's probably a placebo effect. So just be very careful about that. In regards to vitamins, there's no specific vitamins that have been proven helpful. In regards to other supplements, omega fatty three have shown in uh, a meta-analysis of several studies to be helpful. Then the question you ask yourself though is to what degree are they helpful? They're helpful in about 20%. That means that if it's going to be helpful, its symptom reduction is about 20%. And there, and that's a range, okay? So you can try that again. Do it for two months. See what effect it has. Make sure you make a list, a written list of the symptoms that you're going to follow, and then you assess it two months later and see if it helps. If it helps, great, then stay on it. If it doesn't help, then save yourself money for taking it for a year or so. So we talked about vitamins. We talked about supplements, uh, zinc. So some people think that zinc helps. There's two studies that I know of, well-controlled, double-blind studies out of Iran, interestingly, that showed that zinc helped. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. Um, I don't recommend zinc, but again, if you want to try it, you do it for two months and figure it out. What else have I missed in that question? I tried to cover um, supplements, vitamins, what works, what doesn't work. Exercise is the last um, sort of natural treatment, if you will, that was specifically asked about. Oh gosh, um, you know, if I could, if I could get all the patients that I say to exercise to actually exercise, um, I, my workload would probably be reduced in half. I, I'm a big advocate of exercise. I myself have been a regular exerciser for for 40 years. Um, I think exercise helps in in so many ways. It improves energy, it improves stamina, um, it keeps the weight off, it improves your attention and cognition, 
Um, it is helpful for ADHD. By the way, there are studies looking at exercise specifically in ADHD. The question though is, um, how long does the effect sustain itself? So unless you're regularly exercising, and that's at least three times a week, aerobic exercise, um, that can be helpful. If it's less than that, it probably isn't substantial. If it's more than that, well, God bless if, you, uh, if you're exercising that way. So the answer to that is yes, exercise is helpful. Now, a lot of people associate exercise with huffing and puffing and sweating and going to the gym. If you could just go for a walk for 30 minutes a day for a walk, put in ear pods, put in headphones, listen to a podcast. My favorite, by the way, is I go for a walk or a run and I'm listening to stand up comedy. I, I'm the guy who's walking along and laughing as if um, like there's no tomorrow. So I, I'm a big believer in exercise. And yes, my patients who do it regularly say it really is helpful. Wonderful. Well, I'm very sorry to say that our time is actually up. I feel we could have gone on easily for another hour or two, but um, Dr. Goodman, this was incredibly helpful and um, we have more questions than we could ever answer, but thank you so much for the, the thorough job you did in addressing the concerns of the Attitude readers. Well, great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. To, to everyone listening, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you want to make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars or in articles, research updates, all that good stuff, um, please visit attitudemag.com slash newsletters. You can sign up for the ones that make the most sense for you. And Dr. Goodman, thank you again on behalf of the entire Attitude team. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-Mag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-Mag.com.